Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Ros Taylor, and I'm delighted to be chairing two plenaries to end the day. And the first conversation is going to be with Linda Magistris. This is going to be a conversation. And we're going to be talking about bereavement. And Tracy Bleakley, CEO of Hospice UK, just reminded me that this is the first time, probably for a very long time, that bereavement has been featured in a plenary at Hospice UK and also wanted to flag up that there is an open, new open grants program to support bereavement projects. So details are on the Hospice UK website. So for all of you working in hospices and hospitals. So I, many of you will know Linda. Linda is a television, is an actress. Any of those who remember Grange Hill? She is a TV presenter, but she's here today to talk to us about her interest in better access to bereavement support and her new charity, the Good Grief Trust. So first of all, Linda, my first question is, what led you to your passion to increase access to bereavement support? Well, if we can show the first slide, please. So that's the Good Grief Trust. So this is a new charity that I founded a year ago. Um, my partner, can we have the second slide, please? There he is. <laughs> so this is Graham Theakston. Um, and as Ross said, I used to be in a program called Grange Hill, which is a BBC program back in 70s and 80s. And Graham um, was one of our directors. He was 11 years older than me. I worked with him um, for a couple of years. And then he went off. Um, won a BAFTA um, and worked for 30 years in the business very successfully and I did a bit of acting and then weirdly I came out of my marriage um, 10 years ago now and he came out of a long-term relationship and we literally just bumped into each other in Wimbledon Village and he'd been living down the road 10 minutes away for 25 years and that was it we were together so we were together for eight years um, he died three years ago of a soft tissue sarcoma, which was missed, sadly, for a year. Uh, so when they found it, he only had five and a half months, and then he died. So I had a really, really difficult time when he died. Um, I'd lost my father 17 years before, who was completely amazing, and he was my rock, but it was utterly, utterly different when Graham died. I literally thought I was going mad. I literally thought I am going crazy. I used to march across Wimbledon Common shouting, where on earth are you? I just couldn't understand where the man I was sleeping with, laughing with, joking with, who was so incredibly charismatic and intelligent, was now in a pot. And that really did something to my head. Anyway, so basically what I did, I went to the GP and I said, you have to help me, I'm going crazy. So he gave me a leaflet for Cruz. Um, sadly, I live in Wandsworth. I couldn't access anything at all. They gave me a waiting list of about six months to get a support group. I knew I just didn't want to speak to someone on the phone. I needed to see someone. So I had to pretend. I pretend I lived in Kensington, Chelsea. I went up there. Um, I saw a counsellor for four sessions, which was fine. Um, I just cried through the whole lot. And it was just really, I, nothing really helped me. So I went back to my GP and he said, well, take some pills. You know, if you need to calm down, you need to sleep. But for me, I don't even take a paracetamol. It just wasn't right for me. I knew I didn't want to numb it. I knew I didn't want to just forget. I needed something else. I didn't know what I needed, but I needed something else. So I went back to the GP. Linda, can I ask at that point what mm. role friends and family played? But did they recognise how bad you were feeling? Probably not. My mum, she did, because she's obviously lost my dad. But um, no, to be frank, I don't think I knew of anyone else who'd lost a partner. So um, it was sort of just, that was it. You know, you lose someone and you just get on with life. I was very busy, um, but about six months after he died, about five or six months after he died, I just thought, this is mad. I literally couldn't get up on the sofa. I'd sit, I'd look at the wall, and i think, I have to stand up. I've got to stand up. And, but I couldn't. I was sort of numb. I just didn't know, I, I didn't understand what on earth was going on. And what was 
the problem with me is that nobody else seemed to understand. You know, I went to the GP and it was all very much, well, this is it, you know, here's, this is it. And I just thought there must be something else. So I went back to my GP, I saw a female GP, and um, I was just sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. And she just basically said, posh tissues. And that genuinely is what posh she said. Posh tissues? Yeah, she said, well, what about posh tissues? And I sat in the surgery, and I, I know now she was just trying to make light of it and obviously trying to help me, you know, through the fact that I'm going to be crying for a long time, so I might as well invest in some decent tissues. But when I left there, I literally thought, this is mad, because I am going through something very serious in my head here, and I don't, nobody could really help me. So I went back to the two London hospitals where he was treated. Neither of them had any bereavement support they could offer me. In fact, one... Um, I went to the Macmillan office and they said, well, would you like to start a support group? They had nothing. They had every single leaflet you can possibly think about. Anyone who's gone through cancer, every support group going, nothing for bereavement support. Nothing. And I just didn't understand that at all. So anyway, and I thought, right, okay, now I need to do something. I went online. I found, I just Googled, I went bereavement or whatever I put in. And a charity called Widowed and Young popped up. It is 20 years old this year. It has 2,500 members across the country. You know, it's specifically for people like me who have lost a partner under 50. I went back to the GP and I said, what about Widowed and Young? Never heard of it. He'd never heard of it. You know, the, nobody had ever heard of it. Now, do you think that's... Um, I know about Widowed and Young, and I remember referring a couple, of, a man and a woman who mm. lost their partner. Is that their lack of marketing or is it the GP's inability to know about all local services? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both, obviously. Okay. Um, but now I realise those GPs don't have that resource available to them. B before, I was mad. I was angry, and I thought, why does he not know about this? But he didn't have that facility. He didn't have an online database, which is what we've now done. We brought all the bereavement services, what, as many as we can possibly find at the moment, but it's growing. We've got 530 bereavement services on a new central database so every GP can click in surgery, every nurse. I mean, we had a nurse up in Lancashire who was desperately tweeting, saying they'd lost um, a little boy who was 10 in a fire. Nobody could help the family because he hadn't died of cancer. He hadn't done this. You know, he, every bereavement service that they went to wasn't right for them. So it's the targeted support that I'm really, really hot on. We need to find the right type of support at the right time. I mean, let me just quote you. Julia Samuel, I don't know if you know Julia Samuel. She's been working with us at the web, on the website. She's um, founder of Child Bereavement UK. And she's written a book called... Grief Works. Know. Grief Works. Amazing. There we are. Yeah, she's been working for 23, 25 years with um, bereaved people. Um, amazing woman. She says, It isn't the circumstances of the death that will predict a positive or negative outcome. It is the support they get at the time and after the death. This is the key component to anybody finding a way to rebuild their life. It's that immediacy. I felt completely abandoned. I felt lost. I felt isolated. I felt as though nobody understood. And that, sadly, is the problem. I'm going to show you a film later um, with a lady who um, has, used to have three children. She now has two. A little boy of, of one convulsed in the living room and sadly died when he got to hospital. She was there with her husband. She left the hospital. They gave her a leaflet. There was no follow-up phone call. There was nothing. So she went home. She had her two children. She was absolutely, clearly distraught. Everything had, had completely collapsed around her. Nobody could help her. She didn't feel, again, as though anybody really understood. Five days later, her husband really couldn't cope with it at all. He walked out, said, I'm just going out for a while. He got as far as the motorway bridge and jumped off of it. So she now... No, you know, I mean, she was abandoned in her own words. She started a new charity in Wales. She's helping a lot of people. But this is what seems to happen, is that you go through that sort of, you know, massive, massive, life-changing uh, circumstances, and you hopefully will try and, and help. So I'm really interested, because there's a lot of hospices in the room, and many hospices have expert bereavement services, all sorts of different services to support people they've cared for and some who they haven't cared for. But there's been, maybe it's a myth, and I don't know who we might have um, time to discuss that, but often hospices don't get in contact with somebody for some weeks, and sometimes some months, and yet you're telling us about the immediacy of that despair that you felt. 
And I wonder if you can talk a bit more about that and how you see the Good Grief Trust changing. Yes, so basically, I mean, yes, there, there are rules. There seem to be this, this six-week rule that you don't get in touch with anybody for six weeks. My thing is, and, the, and obviously the Good Grief Trust, we are absolutely really, really passionate about getting people on day one. Get people on day one. So what we've done, we've produced a new condolence card and a plastic, it's like a gift card that you would get at the till, like at M&S. So people will get this, whether they've lost somebody, a, a child, a partner, a parent, sibling, whoever they've lost, wherever they've lost them in the country, whether it's through a hospital or a hospice or the police knock on the do door through a sudden death, everybody should be getting this and they signpost them to the website straight away because it's the acknowledgement that this has happened and that we're here for you. Whenever you want it, you may not even want the support. You may be absolutely fine. You may have family and friends and a, a brilliant support network, but you may not. And what happens if you're that person who thinks that they are completely and utterly abandoned? You know, I mean, so many statistics here. 66% of those who lose a spouse have an increased risk of dying in the first three months. 28% of 20 to 24 year olds, this is a new study from Manchester University recently, 28% of 20 to 24 year olds who commit suicide have had a bereavement. That's really a striking statistic. Shocking. And you and I shared um, a recent, well, actually, it's quite old now, a Guardian article about actually, she's the daughter of the medical director of Macmillan, Jane Marr's daughter. Um, Jane Marr's husband died suddenly three years ago and her daughter had just gone off to university, was in her first week when her father died. And for a whole year, nobody really linked her failing performance, her strange moods, with, and nor did she, and nor did her mother, with her grief. And she then got the appropriate support. But it's a powerful Guardian article, look it up, Alex Crook, Guardian, I think it's about three years ago, the story of somebody in their 20s where grief wasn't recognised. She didn't kill herself, but that statistic is startling. It is startling, absolutely. And Julia goes on um, on our website, please go on it, because there's a lot of interviews in there. We've, do, we've done over 100 video interviews with people, either they're bereaved or some, uh, obviously, from the professional side as well. But Julia says 15% of all psychological disorders come from unresolved grief. I mean, that's another statistic, isn't it? The right support at the right time of death is preventative medicine. It really is. It's utterly, utterly, really, really important. So the other thing that I know hospices have done, particularly those with well-developed bereavement services, they've developed risk assessments to identify perhaps who's more at risk to be contacted early. And I wonder what you think about that. Well, do you know what? I don't think you can tell. I mean, okay. yes, I think obviously some are flagged up and some people, you know, show that they might very well have problems down the line. But I think every single person needs to be contacted and offered that help straight away. And it's just, it's, a, it's like a, a hand of friendship. You're just saying to the people, listen, if you need us, we're here for you. But you make that call. And this is what I'm really trying to advocate is, we were talking about it earlier, is it's sort of using the volunteers. I mean, I've volunteered at the Marsden for many years, you know, since, since Graham died. Different hospitals have incredible resources for their volunteers. Let's get them all just making one phone call. As soon as someone's bereaved, listen, my name is Linda. I'm here for you if you need us. Call us if you need us. If you don't, absolutely, we're fine. Do you need anything? Great. And then another follow-up call, you know, a month's time or something. Because obviously, as soon as the funeral's over, that's it. Everybody goes. They go very quiet, and everybody assumes that, okay, you know, you should be getting back to normal eventually. I've lost so many friends, really, really key dear friends, because they just don't understand, and they either say something really, really hurtful, and you can't sort of get over it, or they say ridiculous things like, well, you know, it's been a year. Come on, you know, get on with it. I mean, it's really, just, like, can I just, a couple sure. of... Um, uh, notes here from our Facebook group. Now, our Facebook group is only a year old, but it's reached 625,000 people. Um, one of the posts um, was shared over 6,000 times, and this is one of the quotes. If you know someone who has lost a very important person in their life and you're afraid to mention them because you think you may make them sad by reminding them that they died, you're not reminding them. They didn't forget that they died. What you're reminding them of is that you remember that they lived, and that's a great, great gift. 
And that clearly resonates with so many people. The fact that you know, people are walking across the road, not talking, you know, hiding. Not, I mean, I had a friend the other day come up to me who said that his, his um, friends had lost the, their son in a really, really tragic circumstance. And, she, and he was saying, well, she's very angry. I don't like to say anything. It's been about a year, you know, but we're leaving her alone. It's utterly the wrong thing to do. I mean, we need... I mean, look at me. I'm absolutely desperate to talk about Graham Theakston. You know, desperate to talk about him. We've got other um, things pe um, people have said. So I think it's a great idea of talking about the Good Grief Charts. It would have helped me after my husband committed suicide. It's a minefield out there. Um, any leads in that situation is probably a good start, um, but there's a lot of searching for someone who is in a desperate situation and not much help or support. Even then, I was sent... This is somebody who lost her, her son in July. She said, I struggled to find any support and spent hours searching the internet for the right place to go. Even then, I was sent from pillar to post with bereavement charities sending me for, to a baby loss charity, and then because my son was beyond neonatal death, they sent me back to the bereavement charity. It's crazy. So I really hope people get behind your website and make sure it makes it a little easier for those who have been bereaved. I mean, it's just... We get so many... I'm so mad right now that as a 49-year-old widow with two young children, the financial and legal stuff is a nightmare. It's cold, it's dark, and it's lonely. And I really feel for those who have less support than I do, because even as a person who can reach out, it's a relentless nightmare. And one last one is a chap who, um, Paul, I was 10 years old when I lost my dad in a car accident. It completely ruined my life. I'm still finding it hard to deal with. Um, this morning I burst into tears when I saw you, I was on the BBC, whilst watching it. It's ruled my life for over 30 years. It's a nightmare. So it's, you know, not just now, it's, it's years in advance as well. So it, it's now and in the future, and of course many hospices won't be supporting people who have died by suicide, or road accident, or have died in hospital with no contact with the hospice. So I'm thinking, we've got a, we're going to show Linda's film in a few minutes, but... I know Tracy was very keen that we have a few questions. So if we have, we've got time for two or three questions before we carry on asking Linda. I'm interested in her ambitions for her charity and top tips for hospices. But have we prompted any curiosity from any of you? And there are some roving microphones. There's a, there's Elora, I can see. Baroness Finlay. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I know Rianne well in Wales and her story and the charity now is working in emergency departments. The, those who've lost somebody suddenly and traumatically without even the chance to say goodbye, even for 10 minutes, without any preparation at all, are in, it certainly would seem to be in some ways the most abandoned. And I just wonder whether you feel that hospices, as a focus in a community where they are well known, where they have a high level of confidence from the local population, should actually take on the coordinating role for you, irrespective of the death. <clears throat> some do, some children's hospices do, and in Wales we, we've had some examples of superb practice in a total crisis where both parents were dead and the children's hospice picked up the children. Um, but it, I think that hospices generally have been a bit scared about dealing with bereavement through murder, through sudden traumatic death of some sort, um, and particularly when there are multiple numbers of people bereaved, and linked to that, I wonder what work you're doing with schools, because for bereaved children, quite often the only point of stability that they have is the school, and yet we know that less than 50% of schools have anyone on their staff with any kind of competence training in supporting bereaved children. And of course, some ch sometimes the whole school is bereaved, and we've seen that post Grenfell par excellence. Absolutely. No, the Grenfell situation is, is, again, really worrying because I was down there. It happened on the Wednesday. I went down on the Sunday. And I was brought in as well by one of the um, uh, governors of one of the schools. And I sat with the head 
um, a week after Grenfell, and she hadn't had any contact with any bereavement charity whatsoever. They had an educational psychologist in there helping them. They had 147 children affected, um, and they had no idea. She said, tell me how to speak to these children. I had no idea. They hadn't gone on a training course, so Child Bereavement went in, um, Child Bereavement UK, and offered them a training course, but they didn't even want to let their ch the, the um, teachers go because they needed to be with the, with the children. So that's obviously an issue, but yes, definitely. Definitely. I mean, we've also instigated an all, um, a new all-party parliamentary group on bereavement support, for, um, which is amazing. So we've only had a couple of meetings, and Carolyn Harris, who lost a little boy when he was eight, um, is chairing it. So that's something that we really want to help, is to try and improve training for the schools early, because it's, it's way down on their agenda. They don't think it's going to happen. But, you know, as we know, one in 29 um, of, of, of school, uh, children in, in a class you know, have been bereaved. Every 22 minutes, a parent dies. You know, I mean, it's a big issue. It really needs to be done. And, and the hospice thing, I think, yes, definitely if we can pick it up. I mean, obviously, the, the people who are on our, our database, most of them are offering support. Some of them have said, look, we don't want to be on your database because we don't want to be inundated. We can only support the people who have died within our hospice. But if we can possibly outreach that, I mean, what we're really keen on is going out into the community. I mean, I lost my own friend, Lisa, she was only 49. She was in one of the hospices in the south recently. She's got a little. Um, she's got a son who's 16 and a, another son who's 20. But it's his, her sister, who's really struggling. And what she doesn't want to do is to go back to the hospice and have counselling. So we're really trying to get bereavement support out into the community. Again, with this, what we're working with is um, Caffeineer at the moment. What I want to do is put a swipe on this, so that when anyone gets this, they register on the website and they go and get a free coffee, and it takes takes them out into the community, they go with their friends, they just get rid of that horrible, isolating feeling that you're on your own. You go out and people are supporting you. We're going to hopefully work with some of the coffee shops so that we put bereavement support groups out into the community after they shut, after hours. So they do it in their local areas. And then you also network with your own people who are in locally. I mean, Fiona Murphy is one of our patrons. She's the Associate Director of, of um, Nursing across the whole of the Pennine Trust, where we're, oh, where we're starting this pilot. Um, and we're rolling it out across the seven hospital trusts across Greater Manchester and all the coroner's hubs. And she was the lead nurse for the whole of the, the, the Manchester arena attacks. Um, and what she's done up there, she's put together bereavement support groups within Tesco's. So the big superstores are running bereavement support groups. It's brilliant because they bring everyone together, everyone shares, they even have buddies. So if you've lost someone and maybe you're older and it's the first time you've gone down to the cheese aisle and you can't possibly cope with it, Tesco's are taking them um, individually on a one-to-one -one basis. She's even started bereavement support groups in fire stations for those who feel as though it's a stigma because they've lost someone through drug or alcohol abuse. So there's all these different issues, but it's easy to do. I mean, it's not difficult, you know, and it's not expensive. We just go out and we use what is out there. You know, I mean, she's, for instance, Fiona's used um, all the Girl Guide Association. So we now, again, at Grimfield, we got these incredible little... Um, comfort bags and the girl guides have done them they get a badge it's free you know we get asda to fill them up and we give those to people who are going through terminal um who are going through end of life um so they don't have to run home and get and get bits of toiletries and things all these initiatives are out there and we just want to bring them together because amazing work is being done but but it's in silos, and this is what drives me completely crazy. I mean, I've been speaking at different hospices, and you, you sit there, and you stand up, and you tell you who you are, and the person next door doesn't even know that within the same borough, they are also having the same sort of service that they could share. You know, why, so does that, why do we sharing. not talk to each other? A mm, lot more sharing, and yeah, I'm very struck now that I'm working back in a hospital that there's an assumption that it will all be taken care of locally, and we're in central London, um, but I think using your orange cards and your leaflet would be, go a huge way towards even bridging a gap um, before local support can be found. Um, I'm just thinking then about your ambition for the, before we show the film, just your ambition for the Good Grief Trust. What would you like to see happen? Oh gosh, everything. <laughs> I've got so many exciting thoughts about what we can do. I mean, my main focus is to just join the dots and bring us all together. That's why it's an umbrella. It's an umbrella for everyone. That's why we've got the new APPG so that we bring all those charities together around the table, all those organizations, all the individuals, because you'll have a look on the website there are so many individuals there who have lost 
whoever they've lost. And what they're trying to do is share their experiences, good and bad, so that we can learn and just talk together. But we've got, hopefully we're going to have some um, pop-up Good Grief cafes next year. We really want to put together a new national bereavement awareness week. We don't have one. Again, we want to be able to be the umbrella for that and bring everyone together for one week in, in the new year um, and talk and share and just highlight the incredible work that everyone's doing. Um, um, within their that's own really interesting because we've just obviously had Remembrance Day and we remember our war dead, but we don't remember our peacetime dead. And maybe that's an initiative we should think about. Um, I don't think we've got time for any more questions. I'd really like to take the last few minutes to show Linda's film. She's already given a spoiler about it, but <laughs> I think it's important to watch, and I really would recommend you going to your website, and, if, and many of you work across hospices and hospitals, and we'd really like you to flag up the Good Grief Trust wherever you work. So could we have the film, please? I think uh, the Good Grief Trust is filling a real gap in provision because people don't know where to turn and everything seems to be in different categories and it's so good to have an umbrella place where people who've lost someone and those working with bereaved people can actually have a look and see what the choice is. I think it's really crucial. So in 2012, my youngest son George who was one at the time, passed away very suddenly. He was playing at home on the, the rug of the, car, of the playroom and um, he suddenly had a fit out of the blue. So we called an ambulance, the ambulance came and rushed him to our local A&E department where within two hours he passed away. We left the hospital and for the following days we heard from nobody. We were just abandoned basically as, as a family and um, when you lose a child, when you lose anyone, suddenly and, and traumatically, out of the blue, to then be left alone to try and deal with it, just was completely baffling. I got a call from a mutual friend of mine and Rose, and um, it was kind of unusual for me to get a call from her because actually she was more Rose's friend than my friend at the time, but I kind of thought, okay. So I answered the phone, and she told me that Rose had committed suicide. I remember just being in complete shock and just, yeah, not believing. And I remember my stomach just feeling like I'd been kicked. But actually, in hindsight, I think perhaps it would have been, it would have been good to talk to somebody who completely impartial. I've been a counsellor for the past eight years, involved with end of life care, and in my capacity, I've seen many families at the worst point of their lives in some cases when they're about to lose a loved one. And when that point actually comes, that's just the point where the families most need help and support in knowing where to go, who to turn to, what's available. And there is nothing out there for them. You may get lucky, you may get a good GP, you may get a good bereavement service, you may not. And for those people that don't get that, there is nowhere for them to go. They don't know where to turn. I think the thing that is most astonishing is that there is no joined up service. And I find that bewildering and astonishing that until now there has not been anything. Thankfully, you know, there is um, a way forward if you're supported properly, which is exactly the key point. I don't want anyone to leave a hospital or a hospice or to have the police knock on the door with a sudden death. Um, and not to have that information that is out there. Mm. It is there for them, giving them the right information, targeted mm. information, by going onto the website very, very quickly. Then they can find their regional support or national support, um, and hopefully they'll find friendships, and mm. then they won't feel so isolated. Um, I think we are in, in fantastic childish denial about the fact that we're all heading the same way. We are all going to die. There is nothing morbid about talking about death. I think we have to try and learn to talk about the end of life in the same way as we talk about the beginning of life. It's important as, as well across the country that bereavement services come together because there's actually quite a lot out there, but a lot of people don't know they exist. And there's no point reinventing the wheel. And it's important that charities come together to offer these families the support that, they, that like I said, that they, they really do deserve.
when you're in a crisis, you need to be able to go to one place and get all the information you need. And that's why the Good Grief Trust is so needed and will no doubt be hugely used. To have all those services under one umbrella is an absolute essential. This is a small card, but it can make a huge difference to the lives of millions of people who have lost someone close. We need to get this card into the hands of every person who is bereaved so they get signposted to the website via every frontline organisation. But we need your help and we need your funds. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I'd rather go to a good grief cafe than a death cafe. There we are. Um, <laughs> Thank you, that film says it all really, and you've given um, a great outline of the present and future hopes for the Good Grief Trust. I'm just thinking about hospices in the last moment. I know if you've been cared for at home by a hospice team, and 80% of people are cared for at home or out of the hospital, then it's very likely that your community nurse or somebody in the team will come and see you. But if you die in an institution, whether it's a hospice bed or a hospital bed, or a care home, I think it's that first phone call and that signposting is what we're missing and I think the Good Grief Trust can fill that gap. I hope so. So, if there's one burning question, we've got one minute. If not, can we thank Linda now? Has anybody got a burning question? There's a low, that's a leading question. <laughs> okay, we'll stop now and can we thank Linda for sharing so honestly.